Greetings, my fellow adventurers. Esper here. I'm glad to be back with another monster ranking video. Thank you for your patience as I've just been buried with work lately, but rest in peace. My spirits are soaring as ever. With me today is my skeleton assistant. Yeah, he's kind of short. He doesn't have any shins. His name is Tony. He'd give you a hand, but he's already given me both of his. He did find a severed head inside a box that you can have, though. What? What's wrong? Not good enough for you. Well, there's also the head he found in Granny's cellar. Two heads are better than one, after all. Undead are a category of creature that just keeps giving and giving. They have so much gruesome style and so many possibilities that no other monster type has. So I am back to present the undead of Volo's Guide and more than Kynan's Tome, as well as a couple monsters from the monster manual that I overlooked during my first undead ranking. Tony, you have to help me keep an eye on these things. And a brain. And a couple fingers never hurt. Grab your shovel and grave robin tools. Tony, it's time to trench the cemetery. First, we find that the shallowest grave here is actually empty. Digging through all the pages of the bestiaries is quite an undertaking if you have the guts for it. I don't really have a bone to pick with any of the undead in this ranking, so F tier doesn't have any body in it. So the first monster we encounter is actually in D tier. The Witherling exemplifies the limitations that D tier monsters have with a wickedly cool style, but low stats otherwise. It is a skeletal knoll whose flesh was consumed by its brethren, and it was reanimated in a dark ritual to the demon lord Yenogu. It's simple and effective in its role as a minor monster. The Nightwalker is another one of those monsters that I expected to be much higher in the ranking, but after analyzing it, it turns out to be painfully boring and one-dimensional. Sure, it's very, very powerful and has some decent combat abilities, but it's so one-track, such basic lore, I just came away from the entry highly unsatisfied. I do think it would be cool for a DM to add on to the base concept of the Nightwalker and modify it some, but the same could be said of about any monster, and besides, these rankings specifically look at the monsters as presented in the books. The Nightwalker on the whole relates to a bigger criticism I have with the negative plane. Yeah, criticizing a negative plane, huh? Listen to this. Stepping into the negative plane is tantamount to suicide, since the plane sucks the life and soul from such audacious creatures and annihilates them at once. Yeah, it sounds all hardcore, but think about it. There's so little you can even do with it. There's no life, no society, no human condition. Basically, it's a black hole for storytelling. It's probably the most boring plane in all of D&D, and I wish either it just didn't exist, or that its concept was relegated to a single location or a region within the Shadowfell. Spawnachias continues in the same vein of one-track creatures with highly basic stories. This undead does have a connection to a bigger and greater Caius lore, but its own lore is really simple and limited. Basically, we have a worm zombie that just wants to attack and infect the living. It's simple, freaky, effective, not much else to say. C tier is typically the largest tier in every ranking, and this one's no exception. It takes dedication to get through them all, but, you know, I love monsters, so really it's no skin off my back. Tony doesn't mind either. No, really, he has no mind. Despite being at the bottom of C tier, I love the Vampiric Mist. It's a pretty limited monster in terms of what it can do in the game, but what it does is so freaking cool. And as such, I give it my stamp of just plain old cool. I simply love the idea of a vampire who was defeated and found itself unable to return back to its coffin to reconstitute. It loses its mind and much of its sentience, and then rolls in at night on the fog banks to quench its eternal thirst for blood. It also reminds me of one of my favorite cards from Shadows Over Innistrad, Elusive Tormentor, which can transform into Insidious Mist. The Nagas are a creature type that's always appealed to me. They seem to hold a lot of potential. 
Unfortunately, at least in the 5e monster manual, their lore is really limited. Their backstory is vague. And not in a mysterious and compelling way, but in like a lazy writing way. At least the Bone Naga has a bit more backstory, being a spiteful creation made by rival Yuan Ti. Anyhow, the Bone Naga is still a somewhat cool monster. I can't hate on a giant skeletal snake that casts spells and speaks. The Bodak is another undead with rock bottom role playing potential and not much versatility at all. But it is rather competent at what it does. And what does it do? Suck the life out of everything. It has abilities such as Aura of Annihilation, Withering Gaze, and Death Gaze. In a way, it has a bit of similarity with the Nightwalker, except that Bodaks come from fanatics who served Orcus, the demon lord of undeath. The Alip, Alip, Alip. This creature is an undead incorporeal monster that can get lost between the Wraith and the Shadow. The defining trait that differentiates an Alip is its madness, specifically madness that came from it uncovering terrible secrets while it was still alive. Its capacity for role playing and storytelling place it near the very top of C tier. I quite enjoyed the Bone Claw in 3.5 edition and 4e. Now I'm pleased to see them reappear in 5th edition. They have a new lore now that states Bone Claws are mages who failed the harrowing process of becoming liches. In other words, these unsuccessful spellcasters are racked and twisted into the form of Bone Claws. It strikes me as really odd. The backstory in and of itself is cool, but the Bone Claw is not the correct monster. It doesn't fit. It'd be much better for some kind of undead arcane ooze, like a melted wizard corrupted into a blob of necromantic flesh, or even just some kind of deathlock type creature or an arcane mummy. Anyhow, I'm glad the Bone Claw is back, ready to skewer hapless adventurers on its deadly extending claws. Essentially sharing the slot at the top of C tier is the Sword Wraith. Really this monster is more similar to a ghost than a wraith, because it doesn't life drain, but rather it's a restless spirit that haunts the place where it fell in battle, forever cursed to try to reclaim the glory of battle honor that it never achieved in life. The Sword Wraith's combat abilities are where it really shines, or glooms. It can summon lesser Sword Wraith warriors, and it has a couple Warlord type abilities such as granting advantage and turn resistance. B tier has only two monsters in it, but they are dying for attention, and I think they're both really cool and somewhat obscure creatures. After reading the fantastic entries for Demons, Devils, and Drow in Mordenkainen's Tome, you come across an image that very much resembles the cover of the first edition player's handbook. What we have here is the Eidolon, one of the most unique undead creatures in the game. It is a divine undead spirit, a sort of holy ghost that guards locations sacred to the gods. It has a couple really cool abilities, divine dread that can terrify trespassers, and sacred animation, which it uses to inhabit a guardian statue and it fights like a construct or a golem. Warlocks are awesome, undead are awesome, combine both those themes together and we have the Deathlock. While in previous editions they were spellcaster whites or a sort of lesser lich, 5e has brought them into the lore of being warlocks cursed with undeath for breaking their pacts. In a way, the Deathlock is just an NPC Warlock with undead resistances, turn resistance, and a necrotic claw. And this holds it back from the greatness of A tier, but otherwise it has a number of really cool options and a higher versatility than most undead, which tend to be rather narrow monsters. And now we feast our eyes upon the glory of top tier undead. I'm a blood sucker for a great monster, as you know. Just goes to show you that when they say, you can rest when you're dead, it's a lie. On my first undead ranking video, I overlooked the death tyrant, as it's tucked in there with the other beholders. So 
if you thought the Beholder Zombie was cool, the Death Tyrant takes things to a whole other level. The Beholder is already one of my favorite monsters, which I consider to be about as good as it gets when it comes to D&D monsters. The Death Tyrant is a variant of this, with all the same rays of a standard Beholder, just one CR higher in power. It has the Undead Resistances and a negative energy cone that prevents hit point recovery instead of an anti-magic cone. I think Undead Aberrations are an area of untapped potential. Same as Undead Elementals, the Death Tyrant may only be the tip of the iceberg, but what a hell of a tip it is. I covered the Skull Lord in my Top 10 Obscure Monsters video, and I'll say it again how much I love this guy, or these guys. I do prefer the 3.5 edition version a bit more, but the 5e Skull Lord still kicks a ton of ass. It has legendary resistance, a warlord type aura that bolsters undead allies, evasion, spells up to 7th level, and legendary actions including summon undead. The Skull Lord is another one of those monsters that once you read it, you already have ideas for an entire adventure spawning in your mind. A regular skeleton is the most basic and simple undead there is, sorry Tony, but the Skull Lord stands in A tier not too far from the Lich. The Alhoon is an amazing powerhouse of lore and storytelling. Reading through the lore of both Mind Flayers and then the Alhoon is intriguing, inspiring, again it's filling my mind with various ideas for plots and adventures. This monster is similar to a Lich, but a bit different. You see, achieving Lichdom is a grueling and lengthy process, and pursuing arcane magic is already severely taboo amongst Mind Flayers. So the Alhoons are a sect who devised a sort of shortcut. The most significant difference is that an Alhoon does not have a phylactery. Instead, it and its comrades create a periaptive mind trapping and then feed it with souls of living sacrifices. Should an Alhoon be slain, its own mind goes into that periapt. There are two implications built into this. One, an Alhoon has a ton at stake, both in its exile from Mind Flayer society and its intense desire to not perish and get trapped in that periapt. Two, an Alhoon is not a solitary creature. At the very least, it has two others that it created the periapt with, maybe more. Some people say that there's nothing more dangerous than a man with nothing to lose, but they clearly have never entangled with an Alhoon. So once again, the undead of Dungeons and Dragons are a highly satisfying lot to sink my teeth into. I was overall very happy with Volo's Guide and Mordenkainen's Tome, which balance so well familiar, iconic themes with new ideas. Thanks again to all my supporters on Patreon who are helping my channel to level up. I have so many ideas for more content to come, so please take a second to go check out my page. Your support will grab you some exclusive rewards too. And remember, even if you can't join at this time, still take advantage of my free newsletter and Discord server. Links are down in the video description. Well, I had a killer time making this ranking. Thank you for watching. Say thank you, Tony. Thank you. He enjoyed separating the monsters with me. In fact, he takes great pride in separating, dividing, and dissecting all kinds of specimens. Once he cut off a man's entire left side. The guy's all right now. Enjoy your next expedition into the necropolis, and may your adventures be many.